we're on to protection. And this is a little bit trickier because it doesn't just involve you. At some point, you are gonna need somebody to help you with protection and be your helper. The reason why we call it helper is because the helper helps the judge evaluate the dog. And that helper is a trial helper. So with a trial helper or competition helper, those guys, you want them to do exactly the same thing every time, not react to the dog at all, um, not respond to what the dog is showing them. They are doing a certain thing and through that, the judge is able to evaluate the dog. Then we have training helpers and training helpers are really just dog trainers that put a sleeve on. So they respond and have to read the dog and react to the dog. So it takes a totally different skill set for somebody to be a training helper um, than it does a trial helper. A trial helper is very much based on the physical ability. You want your athletic, live, you know, typically younger guys um, to be doing that and they have the advantage there. But when it comes to a training helper, the old veterans have the advantage there because it's all about experience and of course it's all about somebody's ability to read a dog and change their behavior and react. So we're going to talk more about that in a second, but I want to first go over the things that you can do to help your dog in protection. Secondary obedience is the obedience your dog has while in protection. It's a little bit different obedience typically, okay? And the judge allows for that. They don't judge it like they do in obedience routine. So you can get away with a little bit more. But this secondary obedience is something that you're gonna wanna train at home because it makes it a lot easier for the dog once you start doing it around the really high distraction that is a helper. Of course, one of those things is understanding um, what your dog needs. Certain things like barking while looking in the face of the helper. If you can do that on your own, it's only helpful later to the helper. Um, things like a teaching your dog to focus on a target and heal next to you. So we know that the dog has to heal sometimes looking at you, but they also need to know to focus on the helper. And this is for your back transport. The back transport is an exercise where you escort the helper around and the dog has to be prepared for an attack from the helper. So for that reason, it's pretty important that the dog stares at the helper. And that sounds a little easier than it is. If you've done a year and a half of training your dog to look at you for uh, healing around a helper or in any situation, that's gonna be what they naturally do, especially if you give them a little correction. That, oh, sorry, I forgot to look up. So you wanna start some of this, what's called secondary obedience at home before you ever work with a helper. Oh, yeah, super bubba. Good. Oh, yeah. Hold. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Hold. Okay. Super bubba. Good. Hold. Sit. Sit. Okay. What a boy. Good boy. Good. Hold, sit, sit, sit. Okay, good boy. What a boy, yeah. Hold.
good man. Good man. So you can start with that. We have some free stuff. Sport Puppy Checklist, I think, has a little bit of that, as well as the play course that we have on our website. Helps you with your relationship with the dog, but also helps you understand the grip and how the dog interacts on the tug. So that's really important for you to see. Does my dog have a genetically uh, good grip or is he a little bit chewy? And that's why I met Marco in the first place. My dog had a chewy grip and his barking was horrible. So I knew I needed a lot of help here. It was not something um, that just anyone was gonna be able to go in and successfully address. So playing with your dog on the grip kind of shows you already a little bit about their behavior. And you also learn to reward the dog. So if I my dog has a calm grip, I can reward by either playing more heartily with him or releasing the pressure. This is all stuff that's gonna that goes over in the play course. So a lot of the skills you learn there, it's the same stuff that Marco's out there doing when a dog is on the grip. It's the same stuff that we're gonna that we show you in that free play course. So start by taking that. That's very helpful. The out command is huge, 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 huge. If you mess up your out command at home while you're doing obedience, you really put your helper in a world of problems. So do not start conditioning your dog to think that out means I lose the toy. Well, isn't that what it means? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to mean that, it, that he loses. It can actually mean he gets it right again. Out is the way to continue the game in an even more dynamic and enjoyable way. So you wanna start that right away. You'd want to condition your dog to think that, oh, when I out it, I get to re-grip it right away. And that explosion and rebite is so fun for them that the out doesn't have to be such a horrible thing. The other thing that you have to do, you have to have two commands. 
You have to have an out for trial and you have to have an out when you're doing your obedience. So I use done for my obedience and I use out for my protection command. And the reason that that is so important is because in protection, we need something very specific. We need out, okay? We want that dog off of that grip quick, not sticky, not giving a couple chumps first. And in order to do that, we have to do specific things because that's not natural, okay? It's not a natural thing for a dog to just let go the second I tell them to. So we have to do some things to get that there. And they, those things are not going to be uh, time effective to do every time during an obedience session. So during the obedience session, done, it means there's maybe a 30% chance you're getting the reward back, maybe 40. Okay, so the dog's not fighting you there. Um, he, he knows that it's coming back, but he's also not super keen on giving it to you. I don't have to demand that he outs super fast. It's an informal command. It's like telling him to go lay down. You don't say plots in the house when you want your dog to go lay down and leave you alone. At least you shouldn't be. Plots means something very specific. It means hit the ground. This is a down command. That's your competition command. Laying down in the house is just lay down, okay? He can lay down however he wants. Slowly, fast, however. It doesn't matter. He's not being judged. So you don't want to use those golden words in informal situations. Your recall, same thing. Most of the things that we use on the trial field are totally different commands than what we would use in real life. I'm hiking with my dog, come on boy. That's what I say. I don't say here or Vienne, I use French. I don't say that because I'm not going to what I call spend money. I'm not gonna spend my money there, okay? I'm gonna spend it on the trial day. So when I'm teaching these, I'm very careful to be consistent and do a certain thing. With our out command, we want it to be fast. So the main thing is when I'm saying out, always reward. Out. Out. Out is always immediately rewarded. Dumbbells, the same thing. Always immediately rewarded. Okay, later on the dumbbells, you get them used to taking it away. But the rewards happen much with much more frequency on your formal commands than they do the informal. And so does the demand. If you're using correction, you have to make sure that you're going to correct right away on that out. Our philosophy teaches you that it's based primarily on that immediate reward and that's what keeps the outs very fast. But with your informal out command, you don't have to be as demanding on it. If the dog chomps it a few times and then spits it out, it's totally fine. So two separate out commands, huge. Make sure that protection out, the dog is only going boop, not fighting you, not shaking the crap out of it. That is not the path to be on. It's not the path to be on on the informal out one either, by the way, but the dog can be slower and not as clean, and that's not a problem. Okay, now here's the hard part. So let's talk about actual protection training. First and foremost, drives need to be separated. What does that mean? So for simplicity sakes, we're gonna talk about two drives. Again, this is simplified. So if you're a veteran, please don't get on here and you know, tell me exactly what I said wrong. This is for people who are just starting out here. We have prey and we have aggression. And there is different types of aggression, but let's just for argument's sake, we're gonna take one, prey. What is prey? Prey essentially is hunting. Do dogs bark when they're hunting? 
it would kind of signal the prey that they're there. So, and it's also too much energy. All they want when they're in prey is to chase and catch and carry. Those are prey behaviors. So when your dog sees a cat, he wants to run. He wants to go chase it, right? He chases a ball, that's prey. What can happen is if the dog's prevented from chasing the prey, he can start to vocalize. And that would be called prey frustration. It's not true prey behavior because prey behavior is chasing and catching and caring and it doesn't involve vocalizing. If the dog is prevented from engaging, from chasing that prey, you may get barking. And that would be called prey barking. It's typically higher pitch, depending on how, how um, crazy it is. But you can also have really good prey frustration barking. That is a whole nother, more advanced topic. But we're just gonna keep it simple today. So prey behavior does not involve barking. The dog's goal while in prey behavior is getting an item catching it. That's their goal. Okay. Now aggression. What is aggression? Aggression could be characterized as the act a dog puts on when he wants to dominate or defend. So he puts on this cloak of big bad dog that can be barking. That's the barking that we see in Schutzen. That's aggression. He might defend his pack against a threat or show aggression towards an intruder. When we see that defensive aggression, you, you will hear the term defense in Schutzen. It's characterized by teeth. <laughs> That's a very simplified way of looking at it. But when you see, when I see teeth, that's defense. It's the dog worried that that thing is a threat. And they're using their show to show that threat. Hey, I'm scary. I'm very scary and what you're gonna wanna do here is leave. So defensive aggression, the goal of the dog always is that the intruder leaves. The goal in defense is not to bite. The goal in defense for the dog is for you to go away. That's what he wants. So for the helpers, it's super important that they understand that because if they're working a dog and the dog is serious and in aggression and teeth going and they give the bite from there, that wasn't the dog's goal. The dog's goal was not to bite. So you might get a, a hard bite, but it might also go chompy because he's worried about you. The best gripping behavior is when the dog is in prey. That's what prey is intended for. So it's to catch and in Schutzen, we wanna see that calm, full and powerful grip. It doesn't mean he can't fight, but it should be nice and strong. Where when a dog's trying to defend himself, usually there's quite a few bites going on, it's not the calmest. So it's important that when, as a helper, you give the bite to the dog, it's very important that the dog actually be in prey. very important that when if you are going into a little bit of defense and your those teeth are showing and the dog's like you get out of here it's important that you reward the dog by leaving first that could mean just a couple steps backwards but a good helper should know the difference between those drives and should keep them separate so the worst case scenario if your dog is working in protection and you as a helper are at the same time putting threat and being scary, you're also trying to get the dog to bite or chase the prey or whatever. The reason that that's a problem is because you're so scary, the dog's not gonna feel comfortable to go to prey. 
So you're killing that prey. You're desensitizing to the, the dog to those prey movements and to those prey signals. He's no longer even looking at that prey item because you're too scary. So sometimes you might see the dog when the helper goes to give him the, the bite, the dog doesn't want to carry. The dog might chew a little bit. It's not comfortable going in the prey. The dog might have a lot of prey genetically, but he's not comfortable because there's been too much pressure put on him. So these are things to really watch for. And these are things as a helper, if you're a new helper and you're watching this, um, read Helmet Riser's book. We went over this in the overview. It's the beginning section of the book and it talks all about the different goals of the dog, what the dog wants to accomplish in different settings. Now our end result and what you see in a Schutzen trial, if you're watching a good dog, is a dog in the blind, <gasps> Oh, 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 oh. Now, why do we want that rhythmic barking? That was the first thing I noticed in shows. I'm like, oh my God, they are all about this rhythmic barking. Like, really? What's the big deal? Like, why does the dog have to bark like that? Oh, and you hear it on forums or you see somebody typing, how do I dog get my dog to get that rhythmic barking? And most of the time, the people, the owners, don't even know why. And there is a reason, believe it or not. Took me a while to figure it out. But that active barking, that rhythmic barking, it shows that the dog, the dog's not in defense, right? There's no teeth showing. It's just, ho, 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 ho. It's not like, ha, 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 ha. It's not panicked. The dog wants to be there. He likes to be there. He's enjoying sitting there, putting that pressure on the guy. Ho, 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 ho. He doesn't want the guy to go anywhere. He's like, I can do this all day. This is fun. He's like that dog at the fence that you have to walk by that just can't wait till you walk by his house so he can bark his ass off at you. So <laughs> make sure that when you are rewarding the dog for barking, that that active <sighs> behavior is what you reward. So it might start out a little defensive. <laughs> okay, that's like, whoa, who the f are you? And then it, as the dog becomes a little more confident, woo, woo, that's when you reward. So that active rhythmic barking is just a symptom of the dog being comfortable in that spot, being comfortable putting pressure on the bad guy. That's why we look for it. The judge is not gonna give points to the dog who comes around the blind going, woo, 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 woo. That's insecurity. The dog is worried. So you wanna build that dog up, though sometimes you might see the dog a little worried. Once he kind of goes through that, he gets a little stronger and stronger. He should always, in protection, feel like the winner. There might be a, some moments, couple moments, whoa, I wasn't quite sure about that. But the dog should always feel like he won, he beat that guy. And that's how you make a dog stronger and stronger in protection. So I'm not sure if I'll have it up by the time I put this video up, but uh, if not now, very shortly, I will have our first session of the Protection with Marco Cosconsalo course. I'll have that first lecture up on YouTube for free very shortly. So it will go over protection in much greater detail. If you're just starting out, it might be a little overwhelming. Um, but you can watch it a few times over and over and get a much better idea and hear it from the expert, Marco himself. Okay guys, well, I've got a couple more videos most likely for this beginner series. I may add a couple videos to it going over some other things. Now I'm supposed to tell you to like us on Facebook, leave a comment, all that crap, but I'm just gonna assume that you're going to because you like all this free stuff and you appreciate all the work that we're putting in just so you have access to what the top trainers in the world are doing.